Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for the kind uh, introduction. So it's really great to be uh, in New Zealand in uh, this great city uh, that arrived yesterday. So kia ora. Yeah, I hope that <laughs> I can pronounce it properly. Yeah, but it's really great to hear this morning, the, uh, of course, the Prime Minister Christopher Loxton and uh, Minister of Trade uh, Tom D. Blank and also uh, the Ambassador Wang Xiaolong and also all the other distinguished guests uh, to speak this morning. I, I really fascinated by the, uh, you know, the atmosphere, uh, this uh, great uh, trade relations and also, of course, the people-to-people uh, uh, -people relations that between China and, and New Zealand. And also, I was quite surprised to see, uh, you know, over 40 tables sitting here the, uh, this morning, uh, such an early morning, which is uh, <laughs> unthinkable in China to get people that, that early, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's the, uh, uh, you know, we, we thought about New Zealand is very relaxed, but people get up at uh, such early morning to, to gather here for this very important event. And probably this is the, I've been traveling quite, uh, quite heavily, and I, this is the most uh, friendly English-speaking country gathering I've been attending lately. This is really very impressive. So it's really a, a, a great honor to, to be here uh, with you today uh, at this uh, very, uh, uh, very actually uh, important time uh, of the turbulent time, of course, of that we see in the world. We, we heard some news happening this morning in, in Iran. In, you know, I, mean, I was quite surprised to see that. And, uh, and, and I ca came from Beijing yesterday uh, via Shanghai uh, on the New Zealand airline, which is a fabulous uh, flight. And, uh, and also uh, our, our think tank, which uh, I think Simon kindly uh, referred. Uh, uh, also, the Center for China and Globalization is the top 100 think tanks uh, uh, consecutively for a number of years, uh, ranked by the University of Pennsylvania. And also, we are the only think tank in China has been granted a special consultant status by the United Nations. So what I want to share with you today is about the uh, the, the China-New Zealand uh, relations and also what we see as a, as a non-government think tank. So, so I think that the, the relation between China and New Zealand is very in, involving and very enduring and, uh, and this is really uh, very resilient. You know, over the years, our, our nation has built a robust relationship characterized by mutual respect and also, of course cooperation and of course for the shared prosperity. Uh, today, I'd like to highlight the resilience of our partnership from what I can see, and especially during the challenging time uh, that we are facing in this, in this world, and, uh, and of course, also how to explore further our bilateral relations. First, I think there are several key pillars of China-New Zealand uh, relations, in, in, particularly in the trade. For example, on the trade relation that has demonstrated a strong resilience during the pandemic, you know, we, we haven't stopped, we, we continue. It stands on the, the, you know, several pillars that we are really uh, cherished on. The first is the education. You know, we, Center for China and Globalization, we published a blue book about uh, Chinese students study abroad. I mean, New Zealand is always uh, on, the, on the country that we, we highly recommend. I mean, still, I mean, every, you know, every year uh, there's a large number of Chinese students coming and uh, still I think we, there's about 20,000 Chinese students uh, still in, enrolled in the New Zealand education institutions and uh, this makes about 30% of New Zealand international student uh, exchanges. So this actually, you know, future people-to-people -people exchanges is so important and I think I see a huge potential for attracting uh, the Chinese to study in New Zealand because there's 200, over 200 million Chinese people study English. <laughs> and New Zealand is the five native English-speaking country that, uh, that is the most friendly, I, I, I can see. So I'm sure there's enorm enormous potential. Uh, the second appeal I see that is the tourism because, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the tourism industry has been very significant for New Zealand. And I was, I was talking to the uh, China travel service had here that I was told that uh, the flight has fully resumed, even better than, uh, you know, pre-COVID level. And then the number of uh, New Z Chinese coming to the New Zealand has uh, over 200,000, you, know, uh, you know, since, uh, since pandemic last year and making China uh, the, the largest, uh, uh, you know, third largest tourist coming to New Zealand. 
and uh, after Australia and the US. So, so I'm sure China will catch up, <laughs> probably uh, be, become the largest. And uh, so this is really great to see because there's really enormous potential there. And thirdly is the, the pillar, uh, the thing is the agriculture and, uh, and all, all the related product. Uh, New Zealand's high quality, you know, dairy, meat products uh, are, are really p pollution free and uh, healthy and safe. And this is really highly sought after in China. So, so I, I just, uh, during the break, I saw there's quite a few uh, demo, uh, uh, you know, product in, in the corridor, which is uh, quite impressive and uh, uh, very well potentially uh, uh, have a development uh, in China. And also, I, I, as, as we hear from this morning, also there's a lot of areas so I think will continue to be the uh, pillars, like Ambassador mentioned, you know, f fighting the climate change, the new energy product, new energy vehicles, and all those uh, uh, friend, uh, environment friendly product, which China is the, is the leading country uh, in manufacturing that, I'm sure there will be huge potential to collaborate on that. And, and of course, also there's many cultural exchanges is another crucial component of our relationship. Uh, the, the movie industry the, in particular has become an exciting area of collaboration and also allow us to share the stories and uh, traditions with each, with each other in the world. Uh, the second part of uh, my, my talk would be really concentrated on the trade growth and economic cooperation. I think this is really uh, the backbone of our, our bilateral relations. Of course, since the signing of our free trade agreement, uh, FTA in 2008, uh, China, New Zealand, trade of the goods has, has grown at an average annual rate of 11%, which is, which is enormous, which is very impressive. And New Zealand's exports to China has achieved an impressive average annual growth rate of 16% over the past 15 years. So in 2023, New Zealand foreign direct investment to China increased by 104.7% year on year. I, you know, I, I think this is quite impressive. And also with China FDI to New Zealand grew at about 16.7%. And those figures uh, highlighted the uh, dynamic and mutually beneficial nature of our economic relationship. And the, the third point is the, uh, we, we already see, mentioned about this uh, global governance and, and multilateral and regional cooperation. China and New Zealand shared a commitment to address global challenges. Our global cooperation extends to crucial areas like uh, you know, trade liberalization, uh, investment facilitation, and of course, the, the globalization that we need to continue to pursue, and of course the climate change that we have, have to fight together. So by working together, uh, we can make significant contributions uh, to the global governance and promoting more stable and sustainable uh, world that we are all living this, uh, this part, uh, right now. So New Zealand, often perceived as a remote country <laughs> with relatively small population, but I think it has an enormous soft power. You know, has a regional balancing uh, tipping power and also uh, as, a, as a rising middle power to some extent. So it has a strong influence and uh, an impact in the, in the global governance, particularly in the trade and also uh, regarding the uh, you know, climate change as well. And, and I think that uh, I, was, I was quite uh, uh, impressed, impressed when, when China foreign trade minister applied to John CPTPP, he called the, Trade Minister in New Zealand, to, where is the deposit of the TPP agreement? We're stationed here, so it's quite impressive. And uh, and also New Zealand launched a digital partnership uh, agreement with DIPA, and uh, and you know with 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 Singapore and 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 other countries. So China also wants to be part of that. So you can see New Zealand is already leading some of those multilateral. Uh, regional uh, uh, trade agreement that an investment agreement that China is willing to join, including uh, you know CPTPP and D DIPA. And furthermore, I would think that RCEP is already we had New Zealand, Australia, you know ASEAN, China, Japan, uh, you know 15 countries in it. We should really have a, a RCEP minister meetings or RCEP summit of some kind, really to strengthen the cooperation of of, of our of our relation, and the New Zealand can play enormous role in this respect. And, and, and fourthly, I, I think that you know, New Zealand and China is, is celebrating a, a decade of a strategic partnership. It is really uh, important. 
So uh, just, just this year, on March 21st, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi met New Zealand Foreign Minister Peters uh, to mark the significant milestone, the 10th anniversary of the President's visit to New Zealand and also establish a China-New Zealand comprehensive strategic partnership. So I think this is really important that uh, we realize that we have so many uh, complementary uh, uh, cooperation that we, we have really cherished in the last decade. And, uh, you know, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi emphasized China's willingness to work with New Zealand to uphold the spirit of striving, striving to be the first and to create the more first in our bilateral relations. So this is really a great example of how China and, and New Zealand uh, of a different culture, different system, uh, that really worked, worked so well and, uh, and, and really provide a very good example uh, for how country can get along and, and work together. And also, uh, the finally, I think the resilience of our partnership is re very strong and uh, our long-term cooperation is built on the foundation of in-depth mutual understanding and stable political ties as well. Uh, we greatly appreciate New Zealand's uh, balanced approach, I would say balanced approach, in dealing with China with the, within the global contest. The former New, New Zealand Prime Minister Hipkins affirmed that New Zealand continues to be proudly nuclear free state and uh, this position is not going to change and that's really important because, because as, as uh, Ambassador Wang said this morning, we, you know, this is a non-proliferation of the nuclear uh, 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 you know, uh, in this South Pacific, and we hope to keep that, and, uh, and New Zealand can play a very important role on that. So this uh, the resilience uh, was particularly evident during the COVID. I mean, New Zealand has, has done very well, and our partnership has remarkably uh, shows the resilience in, in the strength and adaptability. And uh, also that uh, uh, I, I think for Mr. Wang Yi has actually also mentioned that China and New Zealand have neither historical problem nor practical disputes. So this is really, uh, you know, really important. And this unique aspect of relationship ensures that we will remain in good partnership regardless of the changes in the geopolitical landscape. I think we will we'll, we'll weather the storm and we will really uh, be more complementary. And I, I even think that uh, New Zealand can be a really a great uh, a globalization connector, a, a peacemaker, and also a mediator, even between East and West, between uh, China and, and, and other you know, uh, you know, Western countries. So finally, I'd like to uh, maybe making some final comments on the continue, continue connection of, uh, of international relations between China and New Zealand. So our, our partnership in the international trade agreements, such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, is so important that uh, New Zealand play an important role there. And the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, DIPA, which China applies to join. And of course, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, that China wants to join again. And I think there's a, there, there can be many track to, and New Zealand can really take a lead on those discussions and promoting the trade uh, uh, liberalization, which is, I think, you know, we have uh, the largest trading nation of China with 140 countries as major partners that New Zealand can really help on that, on the WTO, on, on those regional things, even APAC, and, and also FTAP, you know, the Free Trade Agreement of Asia Pacific that once, once uh, proposed. So I think there's many areas that we can collaborate to take a lead on, on the free trade and on the liberalization. And, and second, uh, you know, final thought is that exploring the new potentials. So looking ahead, there's several promising areas for, for further cooperation. Uh, first is the scientific research, joint research initiative in maritime studies and climate change can yield re very valuable insights uh, and solutions. And of course, uh, the climate change, New Zealand is a great example, collaboration uh, efforts in addressing climate change we're only benefiting our countries, but also to the global suspen sus sus uh, sustainability. And of course, also strengthen the connectivity through the cultural communication, people-to-people -people exchanges, tourism, we continue to boost the mutual understanding. So we must strengthen the uh, connectivity between China and New Zealand through more cultural communication, uh, enhance the cultural exchanges 
will enable us to deepen our knowledge of each other's society, values, and, and traditions, foster new profound and, 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 and also greater connections between our two peoples. And of course, uh, uh, finally, I think the global governance uh, uh, that we can collaborate together on the, on the multilateral and the regional and, and all those international issues we need to engage in dialogue on the critical international issues, such as also artificial intelligence and development of a global south, how to collaborate uh, between south and north and ensure that cooperative and forward-looking global community that needs this kind of a healthy uh, exchanges. So to conclude, our partnership between China and New Zealand is, is not just a testimony to our shared history, uh, of, of recent really boom and, and prosperity, but also a beacon for the future cooperation. I think we have set a good examples of how China and New Zealand can work together, and, and of course with many other countries. So by leveraging our strength in trade, education, culture exchange, you know, people-to-people -people exchange, and, and international cooperation on, on the multilateralism, we can navigate the challenge of, of today and embrace the cooperation of tomorrow. So uh, together, let us continue to build a resilient, dynamic, and prosperous partnership that benefits both our nations and world at large. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. Please come down and take a seat with us. Come close. Show that China and New Zealand relations are going well. Um, you know, there's so much in that. I think I think all of us would agree with your your key pillars in the relationship. We're here to talk a bit about international relations and and uh, you know time for such a big subject is brief. Start start us off on the the, the China economy. I mean, we've had a debate this morning. Really, the ambassador was good on it. You know that. It, is it a struggling economy? Is it going really well? Um, President Xi has this, this uh, you know, a, a project around unleashing new quality productive forces, the EVs, the green economy, tech, um, which seems to me, you know, it's got a political dimension as well as economic. Yeah, give us a sense succinctly of China economy and what it means for New Zealand at the moment. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon. I, I think that... Uh, you know, after 45 years of China opened up and embraced with the world, I, I think China now is really uh, uh, into a more stable uh, uh, area. Now, every year China added another uh, GDP of, of, of uh, you know, probably almost e uh, equivalent of Australia, you know, to its, uh, to its value. So, so it's, uh, it's important that uh, China, uh, uh, you have to look at uh, China as more resilient. Uh, for example, China has the 70% of the global uh, speed train network. The total length of China's speed train is equal to the next 10 countries combined, whereas the U.S. military budget is equal, is equal to the next 10 countries combined. Where also China has, uh, you know, talk about connectivity, China has uh, 4 million 5G stations. I mean, the whole Europe have only 400,000. So you can see it's, it's well, you know, uh, uh, China has the infrastructure is already the best in the world. Why you have the best infrastructure? Coupled with the, with the, with the labor force and talent, every year China has 12 million uh, college graduates. Uh, mind you, all, most of them are single child, well were, were educated. So that, that's, that's enormous. And then, of course, uh, out of this, uh, the, the 10 largest uh, containers uh, port in the world, seven of them are in China. So you can see this kind of infrastructure that, that the synergy that China has, the efficiency and hard working, you know, that really uh, make China tick. And also that's why China becomes the largest trading nation with 100, almost 140 countries. So, so I think the economy of China, as long as the stability, as long as there's no geopolitical conflict, as long as China keeps uh, uh, the momentum of, uh, going, I, I think the, the from high speed to high quality, you know, even it's a five or six percent, but five percent of 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 2024 is almost like eight percent of a 10, 20 years ago, and and, and it's enormous. So so I th I think you know as long as we keep that going, uh, uh, you will see uh, Premier Li Chang actually said at Davos this year. Uh, I was there also to hear him saying that by next decade. China will double its middle class from 400 million 
to 800 million. So that's enormous. Uh, so I, I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I, I'm quite confident China will be doing fine. Of course, there's a lot of co challenges, there's the problems, but I think, you know, uh, uh, the momentum is there, the stability is there, and uh, five years plan after another five years plan, that, that is continuity China will uh, achieve. Fantastic. Look, um, we'll get our, shortly get our uh, other colleagues up, but, but I just, just want to ask you this. Looking and doing my homework on you, Henry, you have written a huge amount about globalisation and free trade and where the world's at. Um, so I suppose the question is really, where is the world at on these things? I mean, some would say it's dead, that's probably overblown, but, uh, but, but it's certainly been dealt some blows recently. What, what does it, all of that mean for a, a little cork bobbing on the ocean in terms of an economy such as New Zealand? Yeah, exactly. I, I think the world is really getting a little, uh, uh, you know, more more <laughs> uncertain, and it's getting more turbulent and more more dangerous now to some extent. We see what happened in the Russian war in Ukraine. We see what happened on the on the on the on the, on the Middle East and the Gaza and and, and Israel conflict. And uh, and of course, we see the world is uh, is uh, is really uh, uh, unsafe now by this big geopolitical uh, uh, rivalry uh, that you know the country said that. Uh, U.S. say uh, the China is major strategic rivalry. EU say it's a systematic rivalry. You know, if we we're getting that the rivalry situation is really dangerous. And also, I see a trend of uh, not globalization but over secure securitization. There's too much emphasis on the on the on the national security, rather there's not enough emphasis on the human security. You know, human security fighting climate change, fighting you know uh, you know the the pandemic, fighting. Uh, poverty, fighting debt issues, AI. There's many human, human security. Rather than we are all emphasized too much on the, on the, on the national security, so that, that there's a tendency of that. And then we see actually the those kind of uh, uh, security alliances has beefed up. You know, you have, uh, of course, you have, uh, of course, because of this war, NATO has expanded. Of, of there's also five eyes, of course. But also you see the AUKUS, uh, you see the Quad, you, you see the Camp David. Uh, you know where. We're not, all, the, all the countries are getting involved into that. So I, I see that trend is not really healthy. But I would really think that we should continue to pursue economic globalization, where I think China has established AIB, and, and New Zealand is part of that, and also uh, India is the largest recipient of AIB, and China has launched this Belt and Road Initiative. For the last 10 years, China has actually uh, invested one trillion US dollars on AIB related, and then 3,000 projects for the Global South, which is the only big, massive development project going on uh, uh, in the world. And of course, China joined the RCEP, the largest free trade agreement uh, in the world. Uh, New Zealand is playing an a, a important part of that. And China wants to join CPTPP, a, another high level of a free trade agreement, and also DEPA. And the New Zealand is really uh, launching that uh, digital grid. So, so I, th I, I would like to see more expansion of this economic alliances, globalization alliance. Because after all, you know, uh, we've seen the Bretton Woods system, we see the World Bank, IMF, and, and UN system. That global system has carried us for the last 80 years, since 1944, largely in peace without, you know, happening in the Third World War. But that system is already, you know, uh, a kind of a, a not efficient. I think it was, we need a lot of upgrade, we need a lot of new uh, uh, enhancement, and China certainly can play a lot of role in in collaborating to, to strengthen the multilateral system. So I think you know, countries like uh, mid power like New Zealand and, and mother, many other countries could really you know, all work together to, to strengthen this existing global system by engaging China into that. Because China, after all, has already become the second largest economy. And you can't have those circles or high fence, uh, small yard. We, we, we want to knock down the barriers, knock down the, the wall, not building a new wall of a protect, protectionism. So I think what we've been doing between China and New Zealand is, is really a great uh, example of a free trade and, 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 and demonstrating well that uh, we need the prosperity and we need, the, uh, you know, after all, we need the more butter, not gunpowder. So we need the more uh, prosperity and then we don't want to have uh, those geopolitical uh, rivalries. So, so it's really important that we have this prosperity of a trade. So it's talking about the couple, the risk, if we, do, if we lose the prosperity, if we lose the tr free trade, that's the biggest risk. Actually, that's the biggest uh, uh, the things that we want to avoid and, you know, in, in our contemporary world.
Thank you, Luke. Let's bring to the stage uh, Susanna Jessup, CEO of uh, the Asian New Zealand Foundation, uh, well known, I'm sure, to this uh, audience, and also Phil T Turner, former New Zealand ambassador to South Korea and uh, former president uh, for Fonterra China. Welcome, both of you. Um, I I'll let you both have a bit of a go at it. I, I suppose a question, though, um, to ask, and maybe we, um, we go to you, Suze, and then you, Phil, and, and uh, is, is, is really, you know, look, uh, we've just heard all of that. Uh, We've heard this morning from the Prime Minister that, that security and, uh, and, and the economic go hand in hand. I think a North American perspective would probably be, well, actually, these days, security trumps um, the economic. Re really, we're talking about, I mean, if we're blunt about, the superpower competition at the moment, real politics, superpower competition. Where, where is it all going, and, 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 and where should New Zealand sit in all of this? Yeah, thank you very much and good morning everyone. Lovely to be joining you and we're really pleased to have brought uh, Dr Wang out and to be working with friends at the New Zealand China Council to host him. So thank you very much for that. You know, this panel is really about shining a light on the headwinds and tensions um, and really I think the biggest geopolitical question for the 21st century is not necessarily um, the percentage points and who's got trade where, it's really how countries are using that economic heft to project power and how they are using that power to then shape the not only global trading system but also the rules and norms um, that are governing our world today and you're right Simon it's a world that is now after a post-World War II period of um, stability and globalization and free trade to now a much much tougher environment and as you say Dr Wang an environment um, driven largely by interests and major power competition. Um, in practice, we're seeing very specific concerns, and just as Dr. Wang was talking, I thought it might actually be helpful to actually say very specifically what those concerns are um, in a geopolitical context, because much of it comes down to what Ambassador Wang called legitimate, legitimate interests, and steadfastly protecting these, um, because a lot of those legitimate interests as expressed, and I'm very, you know, we can have a chat about this, are what small and medium-sized countries consider to break international law. And so we've got a, a, a classic problem here where we're needing to look at, for example, what we consider the exclusive economic zone, zones of other countries and that China might be claiming as their own, so contested territory. So, for example, some of those, you know, just jotted down a list, um, obviously concerns over the South China Sea where the exclusive economic zones of Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam have been claimed by China. Um, Arantxa Pradesh, Arantxa Pradesh uh, in India is also claimed. Um, concern about trade coercion and how e China might be using its economic heft um, to create political outcomes, um, arbitrary detainment, particularly of media, um, state-sponsored cyber interference and hacking, um, debt and control of strategic assets such as ports, um, uh, control of assets, changing status quo, misinformation, disinformation, grey zone tactics, or what's often called in Chinese context, a three warfares approach. In the Philippines, we have seen lasers ramming, water co cannoning, and announced this weekend also uh, detentions. So now Chinese Coast Guard plan to detain Philippines and what the Philippines consider their EZ. So just, I just think it's helpful to kind of mention those specific concerns in this context so that we are. Um, I know trade is great, trade's going well, trade ought to continue. People to people contact also should continue. But that in a geopolitical context is what's keeping small and medium sized countries awake at night. Phil. Crikey. <laughs> I feel like a black crow rolling in. Uh, well, once again, um, Zhao Shanghao, thanks everybody. It's great to be here and thanks for the invitation. Uh, similarly to, to Sue's, I think we've heard this morning uh, some, a, a lot of positivity about the relationship between China and New Zealand, uh, and that's, that's very fair. Uh, so it kind of falls a bit to Sue's and, and, and myself to be a little bit, uh, a little bit on, on the bleaker side. Uh, I'm currently living in North Asia and have spent 20 years living in China, Korea, and Japan. So I thought I might mention how it feels uh, to be in the neighbourhood uh, nearer than New Zealand. And one of the things that strikes you very quickly 
living in Japan or Korea or Southeast Asia for that matter, is the degree of anxiety about China among ordinary people. Uh, this is very clear in opinion polls. Uh, New Zealand's relatively cautious on China, I think, but polls in Japan, Korea, show 80 or 90 percent unfavorability ratings towards China, and they have substantially increased in the last few years. Now, uh, you can say people are wrong, but the, the people have their views. Now, that anxiety, uh, I think, does reflect many of the things that Suze has outlined. Uh, I know Ambassador Wong, for example, um, mentioned this morning that um, a, a lot of the anti-China feeling is about trying to, to stop China or hold it back. Uh, I think, though, what ordinary Japanese or Koreans tend to see is um, much more down-to-earth behaviour that affects them. Korea was the victim of economic coercion, and still is, I think, today. Australia has been, very recently, Japanese, who have been famously pacifist for 70 years, have now committed to spending 2% of their GDP uh, on defence. They're committed to exercising with the Philippines and to exporting arms. This is a massive change for a country that's pacifist. So uh, I think one of the issues we find uh, as New Zealanders is not wishing to take sides in a, in a global superpower conflict, but it, it, we, we do struggle to understand how this could all be happening without China, uh, China being any, at all responsible for it. So I think there's a sense that, that um, People are anxious, partly because the explanations from China about its intentions are unclear and opaque. And it's partly reflecting the, the non-transparency of the system. We are highly critical, frequently, of the United States, and we can see their foibles publicly displayed and debated in the newspapers and TV every day. We don't have that transparency about China, and that compa compounds people's anxieties about what China's influence might mean. Now, China talks about China dream and some very legitimate ex economic development goals, but China does not define what its political ambitions are, at least not in a way that I, I understand. And that in itself, I think, is a cause of this, of this anxiety. Now, all that sounds quite bleak, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I will switch slightly to say, on the one hand, uh, much of that anxiety is probably over, overdrawn, but I, would, I think it would be helpful to hear more from China as to what the reality of its intentions are. And to switch slides slightly, this is massively complicated and made much worse by what I regard as um, needlessly aggressive uh, and high-risk behaviour from the United States. We see it at the moment, particularly with the election coming forward, that the two major parties in the US are beating, itself, beating each other up to be more aggressive on China. And their language is a language of primacy, of confrontation, and containment. It's like, who's going to be number one in the world? Now, from a New Zealand perspective, frankly, I don't care whether one is number one or number two. Both of them are very important to New Zealand and will continue to be for, for a long time. And the idea that we need to, to risk conflict because one wants to be number one and one wants, the other one cannot be, uh, I think is, is very dangerous and something we need as a country to watch out for. So going back to the regional neighborhood, what I see in places like Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Southeast Asia, is not support for the idea that we should be containing and stopping China's rise, not at all. It is rather legitimate and understandable uncertainty about the extent of China's ambitions and a desire to stop bad behavior of the sort that Sue's described uh, and to stick to the rules that we've spent 70 years pain, painstakingly building up. So I think that is the way, way forward, and that's where New Zealand, I think, has a role to play. Thanks, Phil. Can I just remind uh, the audience, we have Slido. We encourage you to get questions in. I want to spend some time on those questions. I'm going to at the moment, I don't think. Um, so, so do get them in, and we will ask those. Um, this is a business conference. We're going to get positive soon. Don't worry about that. But I do just want to stick with this oh, what? <laughs> super superpower discussion for, for a little longer. And, 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 and typical Kiwi style, be even handed about this and go, go, go on both sides. I mean, if we're talking about the United States, you've mentioned, Phil, um, the most highly anticipated event kind of like ever, a presidential election coming up uh, there. Um, 
what do the two different candidates uh, mean for China and New Zealand uh, if either succeed, I suppose, and we can start anywhere and, and relatively succinctly just be good to get your views to the extent that you uh, are willing and able. Seeing as you, you've just been for, why don't you start us off on that and we'll move down. Yeah. The US election. Um, I, I suspect that whoever wins, we're not going to see much change. And that's, I think, quite alarming. Uh, I think the Biden administration came in with a, a relatively mellifluous approach to China. Um, Jack O'Sullivan talking about the, the high wall, small yard. Um, Anthony Blinken talking about, uh, you know, we need to find a way to live together in the world. But that rhetoric seems to have changed in the last two years. Uh, and we've just heard in the last few weeks you know, economic uh, actions from President Biden, which are crazy uh, and seem to be pitched at the election. It's as if the D Democrats have, have bought the Republican line and they are, as far as I can tell now, as much committed to containment uh, as the Republicans are. I think that's quite risky. Yeah, indeed, we see that as well. Um, we've been polling uh, New Zealand perceptions of uh, Asia, but we also, as part of that, include perceptions of the US for now um, coming up uh, 27 or eight years. Um, and what we find from that research is that New Zealanders are wary of all major powers. They're wary of nuclear powers. But when they think uh, Asia, they first and foremost think China. Um, and through that research, we know that, um, for example, when President Trump was elected the first time around, um, 30, there was a time where 30% of the New Zealand public saw the US as threatening, 30% uh, saw the US as a friend, and 30% weren't sure. Um, so you can see that um, a Trump uh, 2.0, we can expect probably brand USA to get a lot harder for New Zealand. But I think it would be fair to say that all major powers are going to have a big fat branding problem on their hands. Um, we're either looking at 80 or 90 year olds. Um, we're looking at um, people who, I don't know how to be diplomatic about another left diplomacy, about President Trump and all his foibles. Um, but we also see, to be fair and balanced, also similar challenges around Taiwan, uh, China. Um, for example, when Wang Yi visited the Solomon Islands, threat perception shot through the roof. Um, so that New Zealanders are watching pretty closely um, the actions of major powers and certainly the presidential face of those powers does have a big impact on um, perceptions and therefore permission space for policy actions. Any thoughts from you there, Henry, on the US presidential election, what it might mean? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Simon. I, I think a lot of questions has raised. Uh, well, uh, well I, I first mentioned the, the, the US uh, election. I, I think the US election, China would would, would not uh, in, involve any, any, any way or whatever. But I think, you know, the, the the U.S. sentiment in China is already a bipartisan, you know, consensus that, that you you can see now. So no, no matter who is really uh, uh, in in charge, I think the, that 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 structure, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge will remain there, and uh, we will we have some time to resolve. And uh, uh, recently, I have I have published a book for for Graham Allison, who is the founding dean of Harvard Kennedy School, and uh, where I spent some time with him and. Uh, so, so he was uh, changing his perspective that he was proposing that he hit his trap, that a rising power <clears throat> and existing power, when they have the, uh, when they have a, when a rising power take over, they're going to be bound some clashes and destined for war. Uh, but now he he's, he thinks that we can escape that. And also, I did another, <clears throat> I did another book for Joseph Nye, the the, <clears throat> the soft power uh, proposer. Basically, he was saying, you know, there's a cycle of China-U.S. relation. You know, every 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 20 uh, years, you know, from from in early days, uh, 1949 to 1970, in the 20-some years of intense relations, from 70 to, to 20 something, there's 20 years of good time, and now we are in a lower period. But he thinks that uh, uh, by 2035 and uh, 2040, we probably will reach a new equilibrium, we may, uh, you know, reckon each other uh, uh, peacefully and, and we may get along. So, so it's going to take time for, for just, but I think for the China-U.S. relation with no matter Biden or, or, or Trump, uh, they, 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 the, 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 the party lines there, but I think the approach is a little different. 
where Biden is really having all those circles. You know, you have uh, 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 AUKUS, you have a Quad, you have uh, Camp David, where South Korea, Japan was involved, even in our Philippines. So you see, uh, Phil mentioned about uh, those countries' uh, uh, negative sentiment. But those really, you know, if they really get in take a side with the U.S., then you will see the sen negative sentiment on both countries. Uh, that is true. But, 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 but China, you know, like countries like New Zealand, is, if, and then like Singapore, is, uh, uh, like, like Switzerland, they are not taking side. They have excellent relation with China. So, so I, I would advise that maybe, you know, during this geopolitical era, we don't take sides that much. Uh, where I think we, we, we come down to the basic of, of, of trade and economic and, and all those. After all, China hasn't really occupied any places. China never colonized any places. China never sent soldiers anywhere. And China historically is a is peace loving country. And uh, whereas you, ha you can see US has, uh, has 800 military bases, and then they have just re restored the, the eight military bases in Philippines. That's where how the Philippines now is, is trying to uh, disrupt the status quo. China wants to maintain status quo no matter in the South China Sea or Taiwan Street, and peacefully we can we can resolve that. So so I'm 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 opt optimistic, and uh, if we follow, uh, you know, this peaceful solution, let's let's really strengthen the cooperation. In the end, you know, the common sense will prevail, and we we bypass all those difficult times. Fantastic. So Sue's going to jump in. She's doing her level-headed best to make sure no one is sleepy before lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what this session's for. You know, I think that comes down to whose status quo, and, and that's the challenge, right? And that's the anxiety for small and medium-sized countries. If um, for China, status quo includes the EZs of other small countries where they don't have the economic nor military might to defend themselves compared to China, that's a very challenging um, situation for our region. It's also the risk of escalation and not necessarily uh, calculated escalation, but the risk of at the moment where we have two coast guards nose to nose ramming each other, water cannons that are strong enough to bend metal, breaking glass and so on, and now detainments. You know, for small and medium-sized countries, that's not a status quo that they are going to be welcoming, and it's also not what international—I mean, UNCLOS and, and international law um, sees as um, acceptable either. So, I guess um, herein lies the challenge of world order: is that what's whose status quo, and how are major powers going to be using that heft to change order? And so, it's going to be a bit of a tussle over the next wee while. Yeah, maybe I could just add, uh, you know, on, on the South China Sea, where you mentioned about the Philippines. For example, China, China has some dispute with with Vietnam, with Malaysia, with Indonesia. But yeah, they're, they're getting along fine now. I mean, they they are not really having all those uh, problems. And then China, uh, before President Marcos took over, China has excellent time with Philippines, and uh, and status quo has been maintained. It's just Philip, you know, we have a Marcos now, and then he has a newly established eight U.S. military base in the Philippines. And now he's trying to uh, disrupt uh, this, this status quo, and uh, and also China and the Philippines has a has an agreement uh, through uh, their diplomatic saying what kind of level how how they're going to supply those uh, uh, obsolete uh, uh, ship uh, uh, Philippines is is is, uh, is placed there, and then it seems that the Philippines constantly disrupt uh, the, the status quo where China has to defend its position. So, so I think there's some problem there. I, but I hope, you know, through the, the, the China-ASEAN talk, through the, uh, the code of, uh, South China Sea of Code of Conduct, we should resolve those uh, differences. But, but if, if they can get along in the past, why can't they get, get along now and, and even in the future? So, so I think, you know, let, let's resolve this and uh, not really have a lot of foreign interference. I remember many years ago, U.S. said, okay, the, the South China Sea will let the country in the region to solve it. U.S. doesn't take a stand. But now U.S. is really not only taking a stand, but is in the forefront of that. So there's, there's a lot of tensions there. So we hopefully uh, we resolve that peacefully. Are we, are we seeing the world, you know, I think it's a level of subtext of what you're all saying. Are we seeing the world divide into blocks or is there that danger? And uh, how does New Zealand, this small five million uh, person, country with a, with an independent foreign policy, we're told. How does that? Pl how how do we play that? 
if there is a, if increasingly we are seeing this divided, bifurcated. Way. Absolutely, I, I think you know, if if I were New Zealand, I I'd, I'll get the best of a two world. I will not <laughs> decide on anyone, and uh, uh, you know, because uh, I, I think you know that's why I was saying you know New Zealand has exemplified a, a, a normal country relation, does the trade, prosperity, livelihood of its people, and and also New Zealand have a lot of soft power. Actually, you can mediate, you can. You can really balance in the relation rather than sided with one, and you, we see that, uh, you know, big, after all, it's really a big power rivalry, and then we don't want to get involved. In that. we don't want to get into into kind of a, 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 a necessary, uh, a, a, you know, dispute into that. So it's the wise policy is, is to be independent, and uh, and of course, um, you know, uh, I, I can understand you. You can uh, sometimes you have to. Uh, you know, uh, work on both sides, but but that's fine. But just do not take one side and 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 against the other. I think we have to avoid that. And China wants to be friendly with every country, but now you know, U.S. has really put China's major rivalry, 1,500 Chinese company on the U.S. sanction or entity list. China doesn't fight back. China never uh, uh, sanctioned any many U.S. companies. And recently, President Biden has placed a 100% tariff on Chinese. A EV car, China EV car hasn't reached the U.S. yet. <laughs> There's already rhetoric on that. And uh, so China never raised any tariff on U.S. product. So I think, you know, we, we're going to compare uh, high, not compare low. Let's get, uh, you know, moral, uh, uh, you know, of the world is really we need to pr pr continue to push for trade and prosperity and economic uh, globalization. And I think New Zealand is really a nation of trade, and we should continue that tradition. And Suze, you on the spring, you and you, you've talked to me about the three Bs yeah. as possibly a helpful small yeah. nation way of thinking about us. Give, give, give us a rundown of that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, one of the ways that, um, as we are looking at, I absolutely agree. I don't think New Zealand is interested in a containment strategy in the least. Um, China is going to remain a critical partner for New Zealand, but we're also going to need to take steps that um, we judge that meet our interests and, you know, a, a bit of a litmus test there will be pillar two if once we've done our homework and we judge that perhaps that is what we need to militarise um, or at least to upgrade um, our military you know, it'd be really important that we don't see any economic sanctions or any trade coercion from that. That's an example of New Zealand needing to take um, decisions that might reflect its own interests as we, exactly as we're encouraged to be, um, to look at how China is addressing its interests. But the three Bs theory, there's an amazing um, expert out in the region called Professor Cheng Chui Quick, who's a Malaysian expert, and he said the three Bs of hedging for a country like New Zealand is what we should be leaning into. They're, it's build, bide and buffer. Um, we, countries like of New Zealand's size should invest heavily in building architecture and rural, rural building. That's what we need to navigate in the region. Um, we should be out there, um, RCEP, all of the trade negotiations that you mentioned, Dr Wang, in your opening remarks. So get out there and build and be part of real, rule making as well. Bide is, there's no point New Zealand being at the absolute vanguard of attention. We should bide our time um, let us make our own judgments and decide where we ought to go. And finally, buffer is don't be isolated. New Zealand should always seek to be in good company amongst friends. And that's not necessarily alliances, capital A. That's about working with a whole lot of others around the region. Because if there's one thing that's clear, I mean, the Asia New Zealand Foundation, like Phil sitting in North Asia, we're out across Asia all the time, every week, talking to... Um, friends across Asia about the way they're seeing the world and New Zealand is absolutely categorically not alone in this. All the Southeast Asian countries are grappling with the exact same pressures we are. So we should buffer. We should form, um, you know, groups and friendships and be really connected in the world. Um, so build, bide and buffer is a sort of a, a good hedging strategy for New Zealand and the geopolitical climate we're in. Phil, love to hear your thoughts on... Uh all this stuff. Thanks, yes. Um, the, the, B, the three Bs are great. Um, I, I'm not sure New Zealand is a hedger, though. I think uh, New Zealand's position is pretty clear. I mean, we, we, we have a side, and our side is the rules-based order, which has made New Zealand and has helped China uh, be prosperous for the last 70 years. Uh, so I think um, it's, a, it's a great question as to how small and medium-sized countries are going to behave in a world 
which is going to be so different, where the international organizations, international law, uh, the framework that's provided the basis for our prosperity, if that erodes further, we're in, in the shtick, and what are we going to do? Now, I think, um, obviously, th th what we're looking at is a world that's going to be much messier. It's not going to be easily divided I even into blocks. It's going to be much messier than that. But countries like Malaysia, uh, you know, they're not going to form a block. So we're going to have to find our way through messy, uncoordinated, um, unruly landscapes. In that environment, actually, it's possible that small and medium countries exercise more power uh, than otherwise, because we are not going to be completely dominated by, by superpowers. Uh, but it, it makes it very difficult uh, for smaller countries when the rules um, are uncertain. So to go back to the points that Dr. Wong and Suze were just making, the nightmare for smaller countries is a world in which power is exercised bilaterally. The strong forces the weak to submit to their will. Now, you can object to that morally, and I do, but more importantly, politically and economically, that's disastrous for us. And we will probably, as a country, fight quite hard to stop that from happening. Now, how we do that, typically, is by forming larger groups. Now, we would like them to be global, multilateral, ideally built around the United Nations, the WTO, and so on. It's not just the trade environment which is under threat. Things like the International uh, Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the United Nations machinery are also under threat. The climate change machinery is potentially under threat. If the global machinery doesn't work, we will probably have to revert to smaller scale, regional or minilateral blocks, such as CCTPP uh, and RCEP and so on. That's a second best choice. Uh, the worst outcome of all is for small countries to be subject to bilateral pressure only. And I think one of the reasons, as Suze is alluding to, that we find the situation in the South China Sea quite scary is that that's what we see happening, is it appears that one smaller country is being coerced by a much larger one. And we don't want that to happen to New Zealand. So I think we want to avoid bilateral um, outcomes, do the best we can to build a kind of a second best set of rules that might be regional, local, smaller scale. Uh, and thirdly, we want to do our best to stop the two elephants fighting above us. Thanks, Phil. Henry, we really appreciate you coming so far and, and spending some time with us. I'll just be, uh, as our final comment, really uh, interested in any concluding remarks you might have on you know, what you have heard in the discussion uh, that we've had. Yes, uh, th thank you, Simon. I, I think you know the, the discussion was was fascinating, and, and I've learned a lot, and uh, very stimulating. And uh, what I can see, you know, I'm I'm a first time to to New Zealand. I've been to Australia a few times, but the first time to New Zealand, I found this is a really fascinating country, has enormous soft power. Probably didn't realize that in New Zealand, uh, that uh, you know you, you 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 the CPTPP was signed here, and then uh, DEPA was proposed by New Zealand, and I and that's what I'm saying, you know. In order to steer us through this uh, challenging, uh, uncharted water, we should really, uh, really st probably strengthen the, the multilateral system, the economic alliances, WTO, WHO, you know, CPTP, RCEP, APEC, you know, all those things that worked uh, for, for many years. We don't want to really get into uh, a more uh, disputed geopolitical blocks. That, that's really uh, risky, I think. Uh, it's not good. Uh, that's why I think New Zealand is wise to to steer away of that, but really pursue a more economic uh, 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 trade and investment, uh, 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 you know, cooperation and people-to-people -people, uh, uh, exchanges. I, I think New Zealand can be more uh, active in the future, for example. Uh, I, I see many, many investment, and many things, uh, uh, you know, Singapore is booming because, of, uh, because they take a, 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 a unique position. And New Zealand can, can, can be an... <laughs> Another bigger Singapore, uh, you know, uh, 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 of that position, and and Switzerland of some kind. But but I I think that uh, uh, it's important that New Zealand is is great uh, in terms of leading the DPA, leading the CPTPP, and and let's have a RCEP summit in Auckland. You know, uh, so I mean, let's use all those economic trade 
expertise of New Zealand that really uh, give, inject uh, some more impetus into the uncertain world and really uh, to lead us out of this uh, uh, you know, geopolitical driven rivalry world. Because the more we talk on trade, the more we talk about economy, and the more we trade about people to people exchanges, we dampen, we really reduce the political risk. That's I think, you know, the more dialogue we have, the more platform we build up, that will enhance the understanding and avoid those conflicts. So, so New Zealand has an enormous mediating and, and soft power and interlocutor for all those uh, uh, regional countries. And I think, you know, I really uh, have a high, you know, future to see for New Zealand. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, you know, Fran uh, warned us this morning that we'd have robust discussion on difficult uh, topics, and I think you've seen that done uh, incredibly well here by this panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to acknowledge once again uh, Phil Turner, Susanna Jessup, and of course, uh, Dr. Henry Wang. Please give them a round of applause.